Kia ora koutou, no mai, haere mai, ko Erika Austin tokungiwa. Uh, so let's start with the karakia. E te hui whai uh, te matauranga kia marama, kia whai take ngā mahi katoa, tu mai, ha, tu haka, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato ia tato katoa. Greetings to you all. My name is Erika Austin, Community Activator at EHF. Welcome to EHF live session with fellows Julia Bosman, Rain Reitig, and Christopher Dechans on a panel moderated by Jade Chang Taylor as they discuss the need for regulation for security and to protect privacy and more great use cases of AI. This is the third session of the Generative AI series. So we'll be having a 45 minute uh, conversation with the panel, followed by Q and A and a discussion with you all in this 19 minute session. First, some quick housekeeping. The session is being recorded and will be listed on the EHF website afterwards. Please stay muted until Q and A, but feel free to put your questions in the chat box as we go and Jade will be able to read these out. Some of you may have to leave at various points um, in time um, and that's okay. A uh, little bit about Jade Chang Taylor, our moderator today. Thank you so much for stepping in. Jade is a designer, dreamer, and doer, a purpose driven, design led, creative entrepreneur. She is currently the innovation director at Academy EX. Over to you, Jade. Oh, kia ora, Erica, and no ma hare mai. Um, it's so wonderful to have you all here. Um, as mentioned, called Jade uh, Tang Toku Ingoa. Uh, and I am zooming in from the, um, oh, it's quite sunny out there today, from um, Waitakere, West Auckland, where the local mana whenua here is Te Kawara Amaki. So if you know the local um, the tribe from which you're zooming in from, definitely feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, and for our attendees as well, where are you zooming in from? Feel free to rename yourself. Or again, feel free to pop it in the chat because I'm conscious that EHF is a wonderful global community as well. I'm going to start with a few intros, starting um, with Chris. But Chris is a serial entrepreneur. Christopher, sorry, is a serial entrepreneur. It's like we're first friends basis already. Uh, serial entrepreneur, <laughs> neuroscientist, social entrepreneur, author, inventor, main stage tech speaker, founder and CEO of Brainful. Over to you, Chris, to share a little bit more about you. Yeah, thanks so much. So it's lovely to get a chance to participate in this. Thanks so much for putting it on. Uh, so yeah, I've been involved in neuroscience for a long time. That's where my primary training, my PhD was. And I've been watching artificial intelligence evolve. I originally, uh, many years ago now, published um, some work with Jeff Hinton. And at that time, you know, we no one had any idea that this field was going to evolve into what it has become, and that's part of the nature of it. So I was also part of the founding faculty at Singularity University, and the, the principle there was that the world was coming towards this singularity when potentially the technologies that we create, and especially AI, might come to supersede our own intelligence. And um, we are now, I think, coming to a point very rapidly where things that for most of that trajectory seemed very far-fetched and far away and maybe it's like science fiction are now actually coming to pass. And so today uh, I'm working um, on technologies from the neuroscience field to try to have a positive impact on humanity. I'm incredibly excited about what is now going on with the AI technologies and what it is providing and what it, I think, will, but also uh, deeply uh, concerned about the potential risk. So excited to get a chance to uh, speak with everyone about both of those. Amazing. Kia ora. Thank you, Christopher. And next up, we have Julia. So Julia founded the Red Circle, a not-for-profit teaching psychological first aid. Uh, she mentors AI startups as entrepreneur in residence in, at Singularity <laughs> University and invests both in neuroscience advances for healthier brains and infrastructure innovations for climate resilience. Sounds amazing. Over to you, Julia, to share. Yeah, kia, kia ora, everyone. Um, funnily enough, I also studied neuroscience, just like Christopher, mm. and I switched into working on machine brains instead when it became obvious that we will be able to build um, machine brains that are more capable and more complex at some point than uh, human organic ones. 
And I'm currently in Montreal at a machine learning institute called Mila, where I'm, I'm leading a project on AI <clears throat> governance. So that means um, what can we do and what should we do to make sure that AI goes well? And um, you've probably heard that there's a lot of concerns about it. Uh, I <laughs> tend to say we don't want to just worry about human extinction, but we want to instead think about how to create the best possible worlds and a, a great livable future for everyone um, and how AI can contribute to that. So that's what I'm currently working on. Amazing, Julia. I think I um, heard a podcast the other day from World Economic Forum around AI will either compete with us or augment us. It's up to us. So Mm -hmm. fascinating to get into that discussion but last but not least we have Lane. Um, Lane is focused on both the theory and the practice of governance of crypto economic networks using novel blockchain based incentive mechanisms to build more robust more sustainable more just participatory human institutions in the space niche and ethereum communities and beyond amazing Lane over to you your thoughts initial thoughts thank you Jade uh Kia ora kira te I'm deeply honored uh, and delighted to, to be a part of this conversation, and it's great to see some familiar faces here. Um, I uh, do not have a background in neuroscience, and I do not have a Singularity <laughs> University affiliation yet. <laughs> so I guess I'm bringing a little bit of diversity to the conversation in, in those respects. Um, I am uh, I'm a software developer, and I've been an entrepreneur, uh, and I've been... Um, basically building things, broadly speaking, in software uh, for my career. Um, so I have a, a background in traditional finance going way back. Um, I had a healthcare technology startup for a while. Um, and then, yeah, for the past six or seven years, I've been very focused on uh, exactly the things that Jade mentioned in her very kind intro. So cryptocurrency, crypto economic systems, um, but with a focus on kind of the human side of the, the story, so to speak. So a bit less about some of the financialization. I, I guess that's kind of, uh, I feel like that's behind me in my career. Um, and I think I'm excited about uh, humans and human systems in general and how we can use cutting edge technologies, um, including blockchain and cryptocurrency, but of course also AI um, to build all those things, to build better, more just, more participatory and inclusive human systems. I guess my, my AI claim to fame is that I studied with Stuart Russell at UC Berkeley uh, I'm showing my age now, uh, 22, mm -hmm. 21, 21, 22 years ago. Um, and he's widely regarded as one of the godfathers of kind of modern AI. Um, and I actually didn't sort of follow the space very closely until quite recently. I guess that's probably true for many of us. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been dabbling a bit and, uh, you know, kind of being part of um, study groups um, of you know, similar minded kind of entrepreneurial folks who are, who are building things in the space. Um, and uh, I guess the other qualification I have is that I'm a really voracious consumer of science fiction. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about some of these things for, for many, many years as a result of that. Um, and I'm particularly focused at, at this moment on kind of the intersection of these kind of crypto uh, economic cryptographic systems and, and AI. Uh, but yeah, excited to be here. Thank you, Ura. Thanks, Lane. Yeah, it's like sci-fi fiction and also Black Mirror Netflix series. It seems to <laughs> what are people talking about AI and the potential of it anyway um thank you I you're speaking my language around a sustainable just and participatory kind of um a better future better world so um thank you all for joining us and yeah for we're going to be speaking around ethics security and privacy in the AI world and let's jump straight into the questions there's about several questions that we'll go through but if you have any questions feel free to pop it in the chat It'll be kind of an informal kind of conversation and again with the speakers. So whoever unmutes first will be the person that will um will share first. Okay, first up. Oh, and yeah, there's been a lot of conversations around um, I guess I my other role is within the academic institute as well as innovation director there. And there's been a lot of discussion around ethics and AI and um, we've heard about the Center for Humane Technology and the AI Dilemma that was launched earlier this and uh, released earlier this year in March. But there's uh, Google Responsible AI Practices as well. They've got, and that was, I think, a couple of months ago. And then a the UN Code of Conduct that it was just recently released a few weeks ago as well. So it's definitely developing at an incredibly rapid pace. Um, but as of 11th of July, 2023, 
Can you um, elaborate on the ethical concerns with AI generating human-like text or deep fakes and how those concerns are or are not being managed? It's a very specific one to start with. I'd like to go first. Julia. Um, I, I can go first. And I uh, first it made me chuckle when you said the 11th of July, because here in Canada, it's still the 10th of July and New Zealand is in the future. And we're still a little bit behind <laughs> on that and one day behind. Um, and um, the, um, yeah, the problem of deep fakes has come up for a while. Actually, back in 2016, I wrote an article about ethical issues in AI and deep fakes were part of that. So way before there was even a, a term for it. And um, to put this into historical perspective, um, humanity has gone through phases where um, the, the media and the capabilities that we've had have exceeded the media literacy that we needed to appropriately deal with it. Um, for example, when mass printing was first invented, there was a, um, a, a fake book, so to speak, which was called the Protocols of the Order of Zion, which um, which basically distributed um, like uh, malicious news about a Jewish conspiracy, which caused a lot of harm in Europe. And then later when radio was um, first wildly distributed, there was a, um, an audio play uh, based on War of the Worlds that caused a mass panic because people thought that we were really being invaded by aliens. And these are examples for how when there's a new technology for media, at first, we don't have the mental concepts to tell what's real and what isn't. And we just take everything for real because that's just what we're used to. And over time, there will be a few, a few snafus, so to speak, where, um, where we have to get wise to it and understand, oh, things can be fake. And this is how we can tell. And this is what to look for. And this is how not to believe it and how to verify it. And nowadays, if somebody tells us something on radio, and, and makes it sound as if something's happening, we know that that might be fictional. And I think the same will be true for the kinds of media we can create with generative AI. Um, it is just a question of our media literacy catching up to that. And the issue with that is that our capabilities have been accelerating so much that our literacy needs to accelerate as well to keep up with the pace of that. Yeah, I love that. The media literacy has to catch up. Um, there was a, oh no, I'm going to pass it over to either Chris or Lane to respond and then I'll share something funny I watched over the weekend. Yeah, Julia, thank you. I, I, I think that's really helpful. And I think that's a really illustrative uh, historical example. You know, one thing I've noticed in my line of work is that um, a lot of people focused on tech these days don't, uh, let, let's say they have a very short memory for history. And so I think it's actually enormously valuable to, to look back. And sometimes we have to look back a few hundred years uh, to find those examples that, that help us kind of figure out, like chart our course and figure out where we're going. Um, I just wanted to add one thing to what you said, which is um, that, so in some respects, this phenomenon is new, right? So the kind of the, the specific case of generative AI and some of the specific technologies that are emerging right now around uh, generative text, generative images and, and, and videos and kind of deep fakes in those directions. This is, of course, a pretty new thing, or, or rather they've kind of achieved a critical point of um, fidelity recently and will of course continue to get better. However, I, I think it, you know, we've been in a cultural moment now for at least a few years uh, already, you know, due to slightly older technologies. So things like social media, or I think you could track track even further back to the rise of just blogging, you know, which which is already more than 20 years old. Um, you know, going back further than that, but right, if you go back a generation, you'll find, and I think hopefully I'm making your case for you here, uh, you know, because as you're saying, we have these cultural moments when the technologies get ahead of our ability to kind of understand them. So I think a generation ago, um, this was not the case, right? So what we had was a, a very limited set of channels and a limited set of gatekeepers. So, you know, where I grew up in the United States, these are things like NBC, ABC, CBS, New York Times, uh, CNN, you know, Fox, these sorts of things. And, and there are so few of them that, um, you know, they were kind of, uh, anointed gatekeepers, so to speak, and, and, and broadly speaking, you know, we were all kind of on the same page about the state of the world. Um, and obviously that's broken down quite a bit and led to this kind of crisis of trust and crisis of coherence over the last, uh, you know, 10 to 15 years, again, due to the rise of things like social media. So 
Um, it's been a very painful transition where I think we're all very aware of some of the challenges we faced and, you know, whether this is, um, you know, election interference, things like this, or, or knowing, you know, whether the, the person or group of people you're speaking to over whatever social channel are fellow human beings and neighbors as they claim to be, or if they're actually like a, a troll farm somewhere halfway across the world. Um, but I think the good news, at least from where I sit, is that this transition, um, it's not complete, but it's very well underway. And I believe that as a society, we are really beginning to develop an immune system response to this. And, and I think that there's a lot less naivete than there was before. And, and I think that uh, any you know folks who have grown up um, exposed to these things over the past 10 years, let's say, uh, you know, we used to joke and say, oh, if it's on TV, it must be true. If it's on the internet, it must be true. Well, no one really believes that anymore. And so I think we have a healthy skepticism. And I think that this is what we need to develop the competence that Julia referred to. Yeah, you're making a good point, Lane. And it's kind of funny to me how a generation ago, um, when I was in school, I was told you can't trust anything on the internet. You cannot cite Wikipedia as a source um, because that could all be made up. And now the same people who used to warn us about not citing Wikipedia are the ones who have become less critical and share memes on Facebook <laughs> that may be harmful. And I, I have a lot of trust actually in, in the younger generations uh, to, to have that immune system and to build up that immune system. And I think there's a kind of a rapid evolution of that immune system by people um, just engaging with, with memes and information on the internet in a very fast paced way. It's a new form of collective intelligence, and it's exciting to see it emerge. And you know, the the solutions that emerged previously, which, as I said, were things like big, you know, radio stations, TV stations, publishers, et cetera, it will look very different this time around. But um, this is one respect in which I'm pretty optimistic. I, I think that we're intelligent enough as a community and as a society to to find a way forward together and and figure out how to come to agreement and consensus on the ground truth. Uh, consensus is something that we think about every day in the blockchain cryptocurrency space, but I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that's a whole nother webinar, Lane. Um, Christopher, any thoughts around, you know, what Julia and Lane has mentioned or just deep fakes in general? Yeah, well, so I'm going to speak a little bit more about the broader question of uh, ethics and the ethical considerations um, arising out of AI. Um, and I, I want to start actually by sharing a resource that uh, actually comes from one of our own at EHF, uh, Tristan Harris, who who I think has put together along with uh, Isra Raskin, one of the, the, the best um, pieces on looking at this issue really thoughtfully. And so I'm gonna paste that into the chat. And so anyone who's interested in this topic who hasn't yet seen this video, I'd really strongly recommend it. It's very thoughtful, very striking, and I'll give you the punchline, which it essentially leads with, um, which, uh, suggests the potential magnitude of the ethical kinds of considerations we're talking about here, which, um, you know, there's the things that we can see clearly, like deep fakes. Um, there's also the, the longer term potential ethical implications that are much harder to predict. But uh, the way that it's, it's put in interest on this um, presentation is that approximately 50% of AI researchers surveyed recently suggested that they believe there's a 10% or greater chance that this technology leads to the extinction of our species. And so that's a, obviously a pretty shocking uh, concept that half the people who are the engineers on this technology believe that it could wipe us all out. And that's getting more um, uh, widely known um, but but I think Tristan brings up the point, imagine if you were getting on an airliner and 50% of the engineers who had devised that or created and maintained that airliner said there's a 10% chance you're not getting off. What would you do to prepare yourself? And so I think it's very important as a society, but also individually, that we really take seriously that this technology um, has risks far beyond what we can comprehend. Now, I'm not a, a AI naysayer. I also think that equivalently, um, there's potential that is far beyond uh, what we can imagine. And I think that we're currently, from my perspective, living in sort of a Garden of Eden time where you can do things today in an afternoon that used to be things that would have taken a team of engineers 
several years to do. And I mean, I've literally been doing that myself. That's not an exaggeration for anyone who uh, hasn't yet been engaged with this technology. I, I strongly encourage you to try it. It's incredibly fun. And I can talk more about some of the use cases and some of the things that I've been doing with it and others have been doing with it. But I think we're in a time right now where it's very difficult to see the future because on the one hand, we've got this incredible power to do things that are truly superhuman um, and even super superhuman in the sense that these are things that are creating their own capabilities beyond what we can imagine they will create. And on the other hand, you know, we have the possibility of, of truly incredible and, and very concerning risks. So I think this leads to an ethical uh, situation where the issues at hand um, are, are, are literally beyond our ability to conceive of them. And we're trying to plan for that. And we can talk more as the session goes on about things that people are trying to do about that. But as I look at the situation, that's how I see it. I see it over the course of the coming decade and, and, and beyond in terms of being really an existential opportunity or existential threat for our species. A really powerful statement existential opportunity but or existential threat of our very own existence right Christopher there was a quick um question in the, the chat um and I believe it was directed at you because you used to work with Jeffrey Hinton why did he leave Google and I know there's mixed conversations around what this yeah what yeah so so I, I obviously cannot uh can't speak for Jeff um, but, you know, he's, he's both obviously an incredibly brilliant person. His group was, for anybody who's not aware, the really the pioneers of the transformer models who have led to the recent explosion in AI capability. And, you know, he's been a pioneer and a leader in the field for a long time. And he did, uh, after having gone to Google to bring this technology to them, recently leave. And there's been a lot of talk about that. My best understanding um, of, of what's happened there is, is to, to simply take Jeff at his word that that he uh, feels no particular ill will towards Google and does believe that they're smart people trying to do the best they can, but wanted to be in a position that he independently could uh, could could be independent of uh, of them because they have a lot of constraints as a large organization in thinking about and working on and working with others on and being a local um, member of the community on the issues of what. Um, may need to happen with uh, with AI, and and I think he's both from a technical standpoint in an incredibly strong position, and from a leadership standpoint, you know, he is in many ways, you know, one of the, the if not the sort of principal founding figure, as well as um, being somebody who I think is is very deeply thoughtful. So I hope that in making that choice, he has set himself up to be a real leader for uh, all of us in, um, in trying to figure out how to address these very difficult um, and very important um, issues. Amazing, thanks, Christopher. And completely echo your sentiments around, um, if you haven't had a chance to watch the um, AI Dilemma, uh, the, the YouTube link that was popped in the chat by co-founders Tristan Harris and Aza Ruskin. Um, I also listen quite a bit to their podcast, which is like your un, your undivided attention. And there's lots of um, wonderful critical discussions uh, in that as well, if you're a big podca podcaster. Um, okay, second question. So we talked a little bit about ethics, and I know that we'll, that will be interwoven throughout um, the discussion today. But can we talk a little bit about privacy and privacy concerns raised by the development of generative AI and how they are being addressed? Just conscious that you know, three point five came out in November. Four came out earlier this year. I think Code Interpreter came out a few days ago. It's yeah. Any thoughts or musing around privacy concerns on any of these topics? Thanks, Jade. With your permission, I'll, I'll kick off with just uh, just a thought as a software developer. I just want to share a tiny bit of a framework here that might help guide this conversation. Um, well, first of all, privacy is, I believe, a basic human right. It's it's incredibly important. I'm I'm really um, grateful that we're, we're having this conversation. And I think there's a lot to say here, but the point I wanted to make to kick off is that um, in my mind, the biggest risk around generative AI, the way it works today, is that the actual um, computational work is not being done locally, okay? 
Uh, so I believe this is called inference in, in the context of AI. So the, first of all, the, the model training, uh, of course, is done by very large, powerful clusters of computers and, and the big companies um, like OpenAI behind them, the Googles of the world, et cetera. Um, and then this, this model is produced. And, uh, and when you are, as a, as a user, as an everyday user, as a consumer, are interacting with, you know, whether it's ChatGPT, um, whether it's uh, like a um, stable diffusion or, or one of these... Um, you know, kind of uh, image generating models, et cetera. Um, what you're doing is you're basically interacting with a hosted application uh, that's closed source, it's running on someone else's computer. Um, and, and I think there's some inherent risks there. Now, this is not new in a sense, like, you know, a lot of what we do and a lot of the kind of software applications we use and the, uh, the, the infrastructure of those applications are very similar, right? In the sense that, you know, when you, you know, when you chat with your friend on, you know, pick your favorite chat app, uh, with, with almost no exceptions, it, it's it's all you know kind of flowing through uh, a, a third party server that's that's owned and operated by by a company with, with very little transparency what's going on there. Um, but I do think what's new here is that uh, it just that the nature of the data that we're sharing with these systems is particularly sensitive. And and I've noticed uh, the way that people communicate with these AI tools. Uh, I'm talking now, of course, about kind of things like like ChatGPT and kind of text based GPT. Um, they, they, in some senses, almost develop a relationship with them. And I've noticed, you know, you can see this when people kind of start saying things like please and thank you um, and, uh, you know, kind of just treating the, the tool like a person or anthropomorphizing it in a way, which I think is actually a wonderful thing. It, it, there's, there's reasons, there's psychological reasons this happens, but I think it's easy to lose sight of the fact that, that, uh, that what you're talking to is, is not only is it not a person, uh, it, it's basically a corporate bureaucracy, really, at the end of the day. Um, and so, uh, sorry, this is a very long-winded way of saying, uh, making the point I wanted to make, which is, um, I think one very powerful thing we can do to promote privacy here is to develop models that we can run locally. Um, in other words, when you talk to, say, Siri on your iPhone, um, in theory anyway, that the voice messages are not leaving the phone, or, and they shouldn't be leaving the phone. That processing should all be done locally. Uh, and it's even better if we have the code, right, if it's open source, so we can kind of verify this for ourselves. Um, there is work being done here. I'm aware of a few projects that are working on models that uh, fit on, on a small device like a phone or a desktop computer or a laptop computer in the sense that the processing can be done you know, pretty quickly uh, locally. So as a software developer, this is something I would really like to see uh, more resources invested in and, and more awareness as well. Amazing, thanks, Lance. So, I, I say please and thank you. I just like so I've always been taught to use my manners and so I just anyway yeah, sorry. why not <laughs> you go so I'd, I'd like to pick up on one of the, the what I think is one of the deeper things that you said uh, their language I think is very one important a very important one to me as well which is that privacy is a fundamental human right and and I think the reason that it's a fundamental human right um, is that without privacy there's no freedom and um, the problem is that I think, in my estimation, the, the looking back, um, what we will come to say is that privacy was a human right. Um, and that in the 20th century, that was a, a nice right to have. But I think we are already crossing a threshold now where the very notion of privacy is ceasing to exist. And in the face of generative AI, um, I think there's a, a very real risk that privacy full stop essentially ceases to exist um, or ceases to exist in a recognizable form compared to what we think of it as today. So the, the immediate uh, example that you were mentioning and that I do every day is that I'm sharing my deepest thoughts with AI on a, on a minute by minute basis. My creative process is very much in a shared brain between this nervous system and whichever of the AI systems I'm working with, we, we share um, intellectual capacity at this point. And so I think there's a, a deep immediate privacy concern there, but, but I think there's a, a longer term and even really quite near term privacy concern that, that AI just simply breaks the internet for privacy. All of the algorithms, and Lane, you might be able to speak very uh, cogently to this issue, that exists today to try to maintain our privacy um, are, are brittle. And the idea that they will be able to face up in the um, face of what AI is able to do in terms of faking essentially everything and doing it at scale with all available information about every individual 
and you know, it, it, it's difficult for me to imagine um, from what I know, and, and again, Lane, I'd love to hear your comments, or how we don't end up in a scenario where uh, the very mechanisms that today allow privacy just simply cease to work. Um, because if an AI can fake literally everything about you in a way that is convincing to a human or a machine, uh, it's it's hard for me to see what the, the basis of privacy continues to be. And so I think that's a, a broader term concern. And just to, to close that out with what's happening already, I mean, I already see that, you know, the 50 times a day, or sometimes it's a lot more than that, that I get asked to authenticate to do anything. You know, the strings are getting longer and longer. And it's like, will you do this test and then this test and then tell me which of these are fire hydrants and then click on your other phone and then, you know, and... And I just feel like, well, AIs can do each and every one of those things. And um, so I think that's a, a deeper uh, level of privacy risk um, that we're soon going to be facing and really already are. Those, uh, those authentication procedures are going to get continue to get longer, Chris, as the AI gets smarter. It's actually a clever way of measuring it, maybe, you know, that the longer it takes to prove you're a human, the smarter the AI has become. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let me let me defer it to Julia before I respond. To right. Yeah, it's it's an arms race of sorts. Um, I just want to add something very practical to privacy concerns, and that is that your conversations that you have with ChatGPT, for instance, are not private. Not only um, may they be analyzed within the company, but um, I looked at the terms of open air, and they might also share it with third parties. And if you, finally enough, if you ask ChatGPT what the privacy practices are, it will hallucinate an answer for you that is way better than what reality actually is. And then you look into the actual terms and that's not at all <laughs> what's the case. So in a way, the, the way ChatGPT has been trained is on like a, a more ethical answer than what uh, the actual terms are, which say that your conversation data can be shared with third parties. I was not aware of that, Julia. Thanks for sharing that. That's kind of terrifying. <laughs> Um, yeah, just to respond very, very briefly to, to what Christopher said, um, you know, I think privacy is a big part of my work in, in blockchain and cryptocurrency. Um, I think the most immediate place where we see privacy disappearing today is, is money and transactions. Um, and I mean, you don't have to look very far, you know, in most of the places where most of us live and spend most of our time, cash is, is very rapidly dying. Uh, and it's convenient, but convenience comes at a cost. And I think people are not always aware of what that cost is until it's too late sometimes. Um, I think, yeah, I think the, the ability to transact privately, like to have private financial transactions is also should be a, a fundamental human right. Um, and, uh, you know, we have tools we're developing, zero knowledge proofs is the most obvious of these. Uh, there is very powerful cutting edge cryptography that I think can move the needle here, but always, always, always there's a trade-off between, um, the most obvious one, I mean, there's many trade-offs, but the most obvious one is between usability and convenience on the one hand and privacy on the other. And most people, most of the time, will choose convenience at the cost of privacy. Um, so, you know, the, the the depressing part here is that if you speak to young people today, just to, to reiterate what Chris said, uh, many of them, I'm talking now about kind of the Gen Z types, feel that they live in a world where they will never have any meaningful privacy. And they're kind of used to spraying their lives, so to speak, you know, uh, across the internet, uh, across various social platforms. And it's very... Um, uh, how do I put it? Uh, it's very wise of them to be aware that this is going on, and, and they're kind of right in a sense, but it, it's also sad because, because privacy is that, that human right that they, they may not be valuing um, as highly as they should. And, and again, the privacy is like, they say it's like oxygen, you know, you, you, you don't notice it or appreciate it until it's gone. And then when it's gone, it's too late. And, you know, <laughs> pushing the metaphor a bit too far, but you get what I'm, I'm saying. Um, so I think there's no easy answer here. I think education is a big piece of this. I think um, history has some really powerful lessons to teach us about why privacy matters so much and why we need to fight so hard to protect it. Um, so making people aware of some of the, the new risk profiles here in, in our brave AI future and um, yeah, more dialogue on this topic, I think is absolutely essential at this stage. Yeah, I completely hear you, especially around um... I guess the Gen Z or Gen Alphas that are coming through and literally live their lives online and don't ever really question um, their privacy or the data or what they're sharing and whether it be good or bad. I'm really glad that social media wasn't really around that much when I was a teen. So we'll just leave that there. <laughs> 
we'll just move into the third question. And I know that we're conscious that you're um, zooming in from Puerto Rico, New York City, Canada, and I think Portland as well. But this one's more specifically focused around Aotearoa New Zealand and our government here. What do you think they could do to promote AI innovation whilst ensuring privacy, security, and ethical use of AI technologies? Do you have any thoughts there? Because um, whoever I ask across the government, does they don't seem to have a very robust plan at this moment in time. Or maybe yeah, it's so I'm going to I'm going to share a thought that's uh, perhaps a bit post-apocalyptic, but um, but uh, I'm going to share it nonetheless. Um, so. My own view is that AI is advancing at a rate that is uh, exponentially fast and that it's just simply going to be impossible for regulatory institutions to have a meaningful impact on it. Um, for anyone who's not really thought very much about the way exponential growth works, I'll just illustrate that quickly. If you have an exponent that's doubling uh, every year, which is, I'd say, a reasonable estimate for what's happening with AI lately, then you can go for nine years, and in the 10th year, you get a greater change than in the entire previous nine combined. And in the 11th year, you get more change than in the prior 10. And I think that's the kind of technology that we're talking about here. That's hard for humans to intuit, um, but that's what we're seeing happening now. So it's advancing at a rate that I don't think regulatory institutions are frankly going to have any chance of, of trying to control, I think they should absolutely be doing it. Um, and, and I think it's an incredibly important topic, but I have very little faith that regulatory structures are going to be able by their nature to, to try uh, to succeed in having very much impact. And so uh, what do I think uh, New Zealand can do? Well, I think um, frankly, potentially have an opportunity if things um, during the garden phase, to create uh, a ecosystem where people are developing and creating at an incredibly faster rate. I think that anybody in New Zealand or anywhere else in the world that hasn't yet realized that it's possible for a single person or a small team to do what used to take you know, dozens or even hundreds of people to do um, is possible. And so the, the potential for growth is incredible. On the other side, and this is the post-apocalyptic part, I think that uh, New Zealand should do something that it has succeeded where most of the rest of the world failed, which is considering how to close its borders. If AI really does, as 50% of the experts say there's a 10% chance could happen, become a threat to humanity, I would love to see personally uh, New Zealand do what it succeeded at with COVID, which is creating a place where people can, can remain safe, even in the face of this threat. Now, exactly what that looks like uh, I don't think anyone knows, but I think that New Zealand is very uniquely situated to do that and has succeeded probably beyond anyone else in a very recent uh, threat to humanity. Um, and so I think it should be considered again. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. It's getting goosebumps. Sorry, Julia, I interrupted you before. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, unlike with COVID, um, the threat from artificial intelligence is not going to be stopped with uh, closing the borders to human migration. And there are other um, potential initiatives in place that could be done, uh, which is not a topic for this conversation now. What I wanna get into is New Zealand's unique role in the world, um, because on one hand, New Zealand is the, um, has been at the forefront of progress uh, throughout history. So the Maori were the first ones, um, the first um, indigenous tribe that got a treaty with the British instead of being outright colonized. And then later on, New Zealand became the first full democracy in the world where every citizen had the right to vote, um, which had never been seen before anywhere on the planet. And so the question is, what did New Zealand do right to get there? What did the Maori do right to get the treaty? And how did that influence the culture in New Zealand to then lead to a full democracy? And I think there's a lot that we can learn actually from New Zealand, from the culture in New Zealand, and especially from the Maori culture as well, that may give us insight on how 
um, can now this this new um, development be steered? Because in a way, AI is is colonizing the entire cultural output of the world. Uh, all of that is getting kind of chewed up <laughs> by these language models and, and um, generative models. And um, how do we uh, collectively as humanity get a treaty with AI, so to speak? Um, I think there's a lot we can learn. On the other hand, um, it, the, the risk that New Zealand uniquely is facing is that it may isolate itself because it is so small and because it is remote from others. For example, Google is not selling um, hardware products like their phones in New Zealand. So you cannot buy a Google phone anywhere in New Zealand. And the apparent reason for that is that they don't want to deal with specific regulation that is in place in New Zealand. And so because it's a market of about 5 million people, large companies can just say, we're just not going to deal with that. We're just going to serve all the other billions of people in the world. And those 5 million, we're not going to worry about. We're not going to go into that market if it's too heavily regulated. So the, the Balance Act that New Zealand uh, is going to deal with is how do we how do we become a beacon for sensible AI regulation and um, kind of implementation of good AI governance while not isolating ourselves from the rest of the world and, and fully participating in also the benefits that AI has to offer. Love that reframe, Julia. What does um, New Zealand or New Zealand cultural, indigenous cultures or Māori have to offer? And what are the deeper insights here and how we might approach the AI revolution? Sorry, over to you, Lane. Any thoughts from you? Thanks, Jade. Yeah. Uh, no, Julia, that's a really beautiful thought. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think there's there's really something there and I, I think we should all put our heads together and find some time to answer the questions you're asking, the important questions you're asking in the future. That's at the EHF, if, if it's nothing else, it should be a platform for that sort of dialogue. Um, wow, yeah, Chris, very dystopian. I guess you warned us, you know, we, we can't uh, talk about AI without uh, exploring the, the dystopian future. I think it's important to touch upon it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I just wanna add one thing here, which is, you know, the thing that scares me about AI is not the AI itself. Right, people talk about the the quote unquote alignment issue. Um, I know I know we didn't really have time to go into that today, but but that's that's the classic AI uh, dystopian scenario where you know you you sort of try to teach AIs to align themselves to a particular set of commandments or values, things like protecting human life, um, and basically there's no simple algorithm for that. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the paperclip maximizer story from um, Eliezer Yudakovsky, which I think captures this this very well. Uh, it, the, the alignment is, it's, it's a very hard problem, right? How do we make sure that AIs are aligned with, uh, with, with human desires and human values and human actions? Um, that's actually not the thing that scares me the most. What scares me the most is the alignment between uh, those big companies behind the AIs and my values or our values collectively, because we clearly do have an alignment issue with, with these big companies. And we've seen this, as we spoke about earlier, um, in, you know, kind of social media and some other things that are going on. Um, so, you know, I think we need to call out bad behavior when we see it. And I think we're seeing it with organizations like OpenAI right now because they're they're very hypocritical. You know, they they were founded on the principle that what they were building was going to be open, whether that means open source, open for you know, comment, open for contributions. It's none of those things. It's it's just another big for-profit, you know, Silicon Valley company backed by the usual folks. Um, and the values are not aligned. And uh, what I think the New Zealand government could do, what New Zealand as a society could do here that would be really powerful and really unique is to create an open AI movement, a true open AI movement. Right. And unite researchers and universities, unite companies, you know, imagine what a kind of AI focused Silicon Valley would look like. Um, imagine what a what a moon mission, you know, as Americans, we love to talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the period of time leading up to the, the first visit to the moon, you know, in the 60s. What would that look like if we came together as a society and built uh, a platform to have this dialogue, you know, built um, a way to share code, a way to share ideas, a way to share, you know, preprints and, and, and academic papers and ideas. Um, in a very open fashion, because what's happening right now is not open, right? Those models are not being trained in an open fashion. And I think that that is actually the biggest existential risk that we face. So I think that New Zealand could take a very bold um, move in that direction. And that would be a very powerful thing that I, and I think many of us would want to be a part of. Yeah, that's a very good point about the, the paperclip maximizer, because it's a, a science fiction story of sorts, but in a way it's already happened um, in exactly the way Lane said, not by uh, an AI, 
um, kind of being anthropomorphized, but by the corporation behind it, um, building algorithms that aren't aligned with the interests of humanity. One example for this is what happened in Myanmar. So there's a, a lawsuit that has been filed for about $200 billion against Facebook or Meta, the Meta organization, um, because the, the, uh, the Facebook algorithm in Myanmar did exactly what it was programmed to do, which was maximize engagement on the platform. Um, without much human moderation, because uh, supposedly they didn't have native language moderators for it. And what it resulted in um, was a huge displacement of refugees from a minority in Myanmar that was facing a genocide. Because the algorithm was stoking sentiment so much, because it was optimizing for engagement, um, that it led to um, these, these aggressions and hostility in, in Myanmar. Um, which you know it was maximizing the the paper clip or like what it was what it was supposed to do, and um, we so we we can stop talking about it as if it's science fiction because it's already happened it it is going to happen again, and um, if we think about what institutions should exist that don't currently exist like New Zealand is is good also and the EHF fellowship is also good on. Um, supporting new institutions such as the Human Rights Measurement Initiative, for example, that could also be something like an underlying algorithms watch, like Human Rights Watch, but point out whenever things go wrong, like the event in Myanmar, because I believe it's not going to be uh, the last time that we are facing the, the negative consequences of underlying algorithms. So, um... If I may, I wanted to, I guess, clarify one thing that maybe I was un, unclear on. Um, so I was making an analogy, obviously, with the idea that uh, New Zealand might want to consider um, some version of creating itself as a safe sanctuary if we need a safe sanctuary from a dystopian future. And, and I do think that's worth considering. I didn't mean to literally say that it would be the same playbook as what was, you know, what happened with COVID, because it's a completely different threat. So it might not be um, about closing the borders uh, to international travel, although that might actually be an important component. Um, but you know, there's there's many aspects in which uh, New Zealand could try to make itself a safe sanctuary if one of the dystopian scenarios starts to play out. You know, uh, many folks, and, and most notably uh, Elon Musk, have, have made a big point that. Humanity needs a safe sanctuary in outer space um, in case, you know, we end up making it no longer safe for us to live here. Well, there's a lot of question about what that would look like and when that might ever happen. But given the possibility that this actually could come, you know, potentially relatively soon, I think there's a real potential role that uh, New Zealand could make itself a sanctuary given its many features including geography and, and also some of the, the cultural aspects and, and its relatively small size um, that could, uh, all, could, could happen um, much more uh, readily. And that was the, the broader issue that I was, was trying to raise. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear on that. Um, one of the things that I wanna um, address about the alignment issue that's come up is you know, who it is that we are meant to be potentially afraid of in the dystopian scenarios. Uh, and again, I, I'd like to reemphasize, I, I don't consider myself a dystopian here, but I do consider myself somebody who wants to take um, preventative measures where we can for, for risks, even if they're relatively uh, small risks. Um, I think the, the, the threat that I'm personally most concerned by uh, is neither um, that uh, the AGI risk initially or the large corporate entities risk um, but um, malevolent actors. I think what we've seen you know, throughout history, even before human history in other species, is that species will use the power available to them uh, to try to dominate. That's the, the, the nature of how evolution has worked. And um, the thing that I see as the most concerning near-term existential threat or, or very dramatic level threat is that one or increasingly many um, malevolent actors get access to this incredibly powerful technology and they deliberately put it to use. Uh, 
um, uh, as a means of uh, warfare and or trying to control others. And I think that's something that uh, that we need to be trying to think through how we could um, create countermeasures to try to create um, places of safety in that. I think that's already happening and it's virtually certain from my perspective that it's going to continue to and, and be a, a one form of potential near-term threat that we need to defend against. Uh, I think, yeah, thanks. Chris, for raising that point, look, I, I, just to respond very briefly to it, um, I hear you, and this is this is a, a huge controversial topic right now, and it, it is at the heart of this question of whether and, and to what extent these AI tools should be open and if we should consider pausing them, et cetera. Um, I'm kind of a, a very strong proponent of openness, as I think it should be obvious from my previous uh, response. And, and I think, you know, what I would say in response to it, to, to, to your, uh, your thoughts is that, um, you know, we want to put these tools in the hands of as many people as possible because most people are good people. And I think the right response, you know, how do I put it? Like the alternative is that it remains only in the hands of those tiny number of companies and maybe some governments. And I think that that would be catastrophic for the world. I, I think that it's paternalistic. And I think that that there's a lot of bad that could come from that. Um, I, I think the kind of uh, toothpaste is out of the tube, so to speak, on the technology and the ideas here. And I think we should teach it to as many people as possible, make those tools available. And that is the best thing we can do to counter that threat. So I, I'm gonna take the agnostic side, but for the sake of discussion, um, I don't know whether uh, we're better off uh, open sourcing AI um, for the reasons that you just shared or not, but I think it's worth pointing out um, for folks that may not be familiar with this. There's a very strong counter argument that that's the last thing that we wanna do. And that essentially a good analogy I come from the biotechnology space is that the last thing you would want to do with dangerous biotechnology, at least that's not what we have done, and for, for I think good reasons, is make it possible for anyone in their garage to create um, bioactive weapons or, or viruses or other pathogens that could destroy the species. And I think there's a, a, a strong argument, and I don't know whether it's correct or not, that we actually want to slow down the ability of open source communities to get access to do anything they want on home computers because that's precisely going to dramatically expand the rate um, of diffusion of the technology and putting it into people's hands that have no uh, control over them whatsoever and so i honestly am agnostic and don't know which side of that to take but i but i think there's a there's a compelling argument um for and against the idea that this technology should be open source. There's definitely two sides of the story. Uh, I just want to, you know, share the thought that when you take guns off the street, which is definitely more of an issue here in New York than it is in New Zealand, uh, when you take guns off the street, you take them out of the hands of people who didn't intend to use them to commit crimes. You take them from innocent people, not from the criminals. Um, and I think the same is true here. I think that the cat is out of the bag, so to speak, on AI. And it's too late to pause. And if we try to pause right now, the people who are going to pause are the ethical people. So uh, we, we could have a much lengthier, intense debate on this. And, and I think Chris is right. There's two sides of the story, but I want to hand it back to Jade. <laughs> no, this is great. I love the conversation. I love it when the panel just flows as well. And I think, Lane, you mentioned before, yeah, you weren't afraid of AI or the machine itself. I was listening to um, probably another podcast or video. What? Mo Godet or Gordet that talked about he wasn't actually afraid of AI and the machines he was afraid of you know um bad characters or bad actors using AI for um potentially bad things as well I'm really mindful of time and we've probably got another half hour and there's some great questions in the chat coming through from Pa this one's probably you I think Christopher you touched on Elon Musk um before um or mentioned his name um and Pa mentioned that Elon has significant concerns, even though he was the original, one of the original investors or founders of OpenAI. Do you share them? And that's a, I don't know, I feel like. Yeah, so obviously a very broad question. So uh, I'd say broadly, yes. I, I'd say, uh, you know, in similarity to Elon's publicly professed views, I think there's incredible potential for this uh, class of technology. And, and I think it, already is transforming the world. It's growing at a rate and, and its adoption is faster than uh, arguably any technology that's ever come along before. It's changing my life on a monthly basis. 
Um, it's completely revolutionizing what I'm able to do, and I think it's going to do that for individuals, for organizations, for governments, um, uh, for companies, and for us as a species. So I'm, I'm incredibly excited about it. Um, and similarly, you know, I think Elon has also expressed some, some very deep concerns about um, the potential um, uh, on many levels for, for challenges, and I, I've talked quite a bit about that already, so maybe I'll, I'll let uh, others uh, share their views. But, but broadly, yeah, I think he has articulated sort of from a first principle standpoint that with this incredibly powerful technology um, comes tremendous possible possibility and also potential risk. Yes, I'm hearing that a lot about the potential, but also the pitfalls as well. Um, I don't maybe, and this is a really quite generally, you know, being dystopia, I'm an optimistic, probably utopia person. So I like to see glass half full. Um, but Pa had a really confronting kind of question here around what are we if we are thinking about an exceedingly small number of people that escape to New Zealand and let everyone else get wiped out? Any thoughts or reflections in response to that? And I do really want to ask this final question around, um, you know, we've talked about ethics and privacy and regulation, but actually the digital divide. I feel like that's um, equity. Where is that in the conversation here? So, Julia. Yeah, I can answer to that. So, um, uh, first of all, why, while I think that all concerns should be heard, including the potentially catastrophic ones. Um, we need to make sure that we don't let that um, dominate everything that's happening in AI governance. It's a um, it's it's a trick of dictators sometimes that they will use fear to get what they want. And the argument goes. If we don't all stop what we're doing and do just this one thing, we're all going to die. And um, there's a little bit of that in AI happening, um, akin to a Pascal's wager of sorts, or a Pascal's mugging, <laughs> more appropriately. So Pascal's wager um, in philosophy is to say that um, while it is um, somewhat unlikely that the, the way the church told us about heaven and hell is exactly accurate, um, because we're talking about infinity after death, we might as well all live as if it's totally real and give the church absolute power. And um, in a way with, with AI and the catastrophic risks from AI, um, we, we see a little bit arguments like that where it's, oh, because the alternative could be human extinction, we need to give certain companies unlimited power and we need to, um, we need to take all these very, very drastic measures, bomb data centers and so forth, um, just because the um, the downside is so so large. And Yudkowsky said something a couple of years ago where if you don't give all of your money to his charity that is working on uh, AI safety, then you're an evil person and you're risking the uh, survival of, of humanity. And that has those rings of like a, a Pascal's wager for me um because i think we want to we want to scale our concerns appropriately to um also the, the the widespread impact and the likelihood and the possibility of it happening so um you know if if we drive a car like yes we want to make sure we're not going to die so it's good to have seat belts and airbags and so forth in place but we also want to pay attention to the road and make sure that we also don't like that we get to our destination and that we um, generally um, pay attention to our surroundings. And in AI, there's um, lots of things to pay attention to as well. And with that question of um, like closing the borders, I think that is a, a very small edge case, which it may make sense for a government to think about as a kind of um, back off, uh, back shelf <laughs> backup plan, but the majority of the attention needs to be spent on how do we make the future livable for everyone? How do we make sure that AI is fair and equitable and that it creates a good world and a good future for all of us? So that's why I think the 
these scenarios of um, oh let's leave everyone behind um, also like Elon is wanting to go to space um, don't seem that feasible for me because I'm I feel um, loyal to the rest of humanity <laughs> in a way I don't want to live in a world where we uh, just kind of leave the majority behind actually about a great segue, not leaving the majority of the world behind around the equity conversation. Um, and this became really apparent. I was speaking to um, my CEO a few weeks ago and jumping from a call from with her. And she's usually a tech optimist too, um, Frances Valentine, and she's also part of the wider EHF community. But um, she's also raising some concerns or caution around a lot of these uh, AI technologies. And then jumping into a call from that to a DECA call, which is a digital equity coalition of Aotearoa, where people are discussing how to even get access to the internet, let alone their own devices, let alone any of these tools. So um, I feel like equity is a big gap here uh, that we haven't necessarily addressed in any of these AI conversations. But question is, as AI technologies become more embedded in everyday lives, how should we, um, how should concerns about the digital divide and inclusivity be addressed? Would really love your thoughts or musings or reflections on that. Is that the digital divide between humans and AIs that you're talking about? Yeah, I was um, interpreting it from a digital divide as a People don't even have access to some of these digital devices. So how do we, how do they even engage in some of these tools? Whereas there's some people that are obviously using these tools on a daily basis. Christopher, you mentioned that your life is changing monthly. Feel, and then there's people that are developing them at all hours of the night too. So um, but you can speak to it from your perspective around, you know, augmenting or competing with AI. Up to you. Would you like to respond? I can jump in. If, okay, Len, you go. Chris, Chris has more to add. Um, yeah, I mean, it's good that we are talking about this. It's, you know, we saved the, the best and hardest questions for last. <laughs> um, I think the first point I want to make is, uh, I've said this a few times today, um, this technology is not going away. And it's going to hit us like a freight train. As Chris said, it is exponential. Um, and I, I think the right thing to do here is not to pause or slow down. I've heard said that a couple of times today as well, but but also to recognize that it is going to, you know, increase certain inequities. Um, those inequities are not new, obviously, right? They've been with us for some time, and the digital divide is very real. Um, Jade, as you said, um, I I don't have the answers. I don't claim to have the answers, um, but just a couple thoughts here. I think uh, that it's going to be a driver of enormous economic growth, right? Various AI technologies. And um, I think that the ethical thing to do would be for the people who are on the receiving end of, of those profits and those revenues to allocate a portion of them to addressing some of these inequities. And in my mind, the best thing we, the best tool we have is education, 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 right? We need to um, again, not be shy about these technologies. You know, if, if you actually look at the way that the education system is responding to AI and ChatGPT and things like this, it's it's fascinating and very enlightening, right? Because you have some schools and some districts and some teachers who have banned the use of it in the classroom and said, oh, it's gonna, you know, all the students are gonna be using it to 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 to, to write the essays and and you know they're not. Uh, uh, this is this is unethical of them and um, it's gonna it's gonna screw up our pedagogy and and screw up our our curriculum, et cetera. And then you also, on, on the flip side of that, you have some very enlightened uh, educators who are doing some very brilliant creative things, um, like having, like, like encouraging the students to use these tools and teaching them how to use them and then teaching them how to engage with them. And so the assignment, rather than being, you know, write a book review of such and such a book, it's, it's ask ChatGPT to write a book review about this book and then point out three things that got wrong in that review or something like that, a more kind of uh, reflective um, uh, assignment. Um, and so, uh, I, I, I think we should really encourage its use in education and, and we, should, um, we should have an ethical code where people who are beneficiaries of this technology uh, are contributing to the funds necessary to promote these education programs. And you know, we talked about the, the government earlier. I think there is a role for the government to play here, both in um, 
you know, promoting the openness of this technology as we spoke about um, and promoting its use in education, obviously, uh, and hopefully also um, giving us the tools we need to, to address the inequities. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point, Lynn, um, because, you know, education used to have that mandate to prepare students to be productive citizens in the real world. And now with ChatGPT and other AI technologies being available to everyone, what do we actually want to teach? This is something that professors and teachers need to think about um, because if they ban the use of GPT, they may not teach um, the quite quite the right use of, of tools in, in the real world. And I, I love that example you brought up with what did ChatGPT actually get wrong about this book summary because that's what actually will build the media literacy and the technology literacy that we need for the next generation to um, to really have what it takes to live in this new world. So Lynn, I love that you brought up the issue of education. Um, as you know, I'm currently working on a technology uh, day to day that's direct focus is trying to use AI as a tool to increase literacy in humanity, um, hopefully in all of humanity or as many as, as possible, and, um, and that could use this technology as an augmentation um, of the human mind and as a way to be able to take knowledge and essentially act as a preprocessor to be able to get it into the minds and brains of, of people more effectively than has ever been possible. Uh, you brought up the, the um, invention of the printing press. You know, I think in the way that the invention of the printing press made it possible for the species to gather information in a way that was unprecedented in the past, I think this technology has the potential uh, to do things of that order as well and to enable every one of, of the whole species. And so there's the question of whether there's a differential between access to different people, which is a very important question. There's also the question of the rising tide that can float all boats. And I think that's going to be happening um, as well. And so I'm mostly personally focusing on that rising tide aspect of it. Um, I do think specifically on the issue of inequity, um, there's, again, some deep concerns as well. And, and what I'm personally concerned about there, well, many things, but, but one that comes to mind is that um, this is going to be yet another tool and an incredibly powerful one that is going to uh, take power differentials that are already in place and magnify them. And I'll, I'll give a very simple example that we're all going to be living with. So right now, you know, if you call any publicly facing customer service department, whether it's your bank or your government or, you know, most anyone, uh, you know, you end up getting put into a long phone tree and a whole set of processes that really has very little concern for your time um, and is mostly about saving pennies of whatever the organization that is providing that. Well, I think we are already and in, in increasingly going to be coming to a scenario where there's no human at all on the other end. There's only an AI and that's your one option. And, and I think that's gonna be terribly disempowering. And I think that's just a, a, a very small slice of the pie of the ways in which this technology is gonna create and magnify the kinds of disparities that we already have. So I think what happened in the social media in the rise of social media was that there's very powerful technology that has great potential for good in interconnecting people um, came to be used because of that power differential in ways that we've talked about a number of times uh, so that the controllers of that technology uh, use it for their benefit instead of the benefit of all the users. And I think this technology is, is going to follow inevitably a similar course that the, the people who have great access to it um, are going to come to, to use it to create even further power differentials uh, with everyone else. And I, and I do think that's very concerning. And, and again, uh, you know, as a, as a biologist, I think of this more or less from an evolutionary standpoint. I think evolution is in many ways inexorable. And that's not to say that uh, it's not important to try to regulate it. Um, but I think there's, uh, and I can say more about this if it, if it comes up, so some real questions about whether this is something that we are simply going to just have to watch play out um, and we can do whatever we can to try to control it to a certain extent. 
Um, but it may be that it's a process that is just simply going to happen. To expand upon a couple of the things that, that Chris highlighted, um, I think that this is why openness is so important here. You know, the, the G word has come up a few times in this conversation. I've talked about governance. Um, and I, I think while we may not know necessarily the path forward and sort of all the perfect things we should do in the right order, what we can do that would be very informative is what Julia keeps reminding us, which is kind of looking at history, right? Because there's some really powerful lessons there. And in particular, I'm thinking now about the internet, you know, the web, right, being the most obvious, most recent example. Um, we made some pretty big mistakes and, and got some things pretty clearly wrong there. And, you know, among them is the way that the digital spaces where we do spend our time and, and, and a lot of our time, right? And we, we do some of our, you know, most important creation work and, and our jobs are there and our social relationships are there. I'm speaking, of course, about the Facebooks and the Twitters and the TikToks of the world. Um, they are all, as we've said a couple of times today, you know, run by centralized, distant, unaccountable companies that are anything but, um, you know, just and, uh, and equitable and inclusive and all the kind of wonderful adjectives that we started this conversation with. Um, and I think we we have now the tools we know. We know how to do these things in a more open, inclusive, participatory, just way. Um, I'm speaking now about the way that open source projects are governed, the, the Linuxes of the world. And you know, I could give you many, many other examples. This, this is true to some extent of things like Bitcoin and some of the blockchain projects. We know how to do these things in the open in a way that people all around the world can make their voices heard and, and make their values known. Um, and we, we kind of got this wrong in, in the web. So I think it's more important now than ever that um, we do the things we need to do to govern these things in an open participatory way. Love that, Lane. I think you mentioned it before, and I'm trying to flip through my notes um, around the power of the collective intelligence and how we can move um, towards that, especially with technology in general, but um, AI kind of moving forward. And come on. Oh, okay. Some interesting comments or questions in there. I'm going to hand it back to Erica very shortly as well. But um, Julie, did you have anything to add to that particular conversation around equity and digital divide and inclusivity? Um, yeah, I I agree with a lot with what Lane is saying. And when we think about um, equity and digital divide, I think it's important to remind us that the um, the technology that's being created um, and that you know, like the models that are currently owned by OpenAI, are not built with just content that was created within OpenAI. Quite the opposite, um, they have been trained on the collective effort of um, thousands of people. So in in the in the instance of the um, programming co-pilot on GitHub, they have been trained on the code and all the comments of the code that are on, on GitHub that people have uh, added in a good faith effort to help other developers understand what they're doing, not necessarily to train an AI to, to do that or to give away that intellectual property. Um, same with, with the art generation, large models or the large language models, they've been like the, the art models have been trained on, on human artists that um, put their work out there to benefit other human users and viewers, not necessarily to um, contribute to a commercial model so that somebody else can then profit off the creative work that they've done. Um, and the same is true with, with language models that have also been trained on um, a massive amount of of collective output of, of humanity um, without notifying the creators, obviously, that this has been happening uh, without compensating anyone for their intellectual output. Um, and, and also a large amount of the work has not just happened in Silicon Valley, but there have been very low, low wage efforts in, in Africa and other low wage countries, uh, low wage places to, to manually label and tag the input and such. So, um the yeah when when we think about oh this this model is now now owned by a corporation um it's just because we didn't have any laws or regulation in place that would go hang on a second like where's that all the data coming from <laughs> you know is it actually fair to just take that without giving back um 
and uh, this is a conversation that um, needs to happen globally within um, within governments, but also kind of societally to to be aware that we're not just being bestowed this new technology from Silicon Valley, but it's actually something that is built on the collective cultural output of all of humanity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go, go online. Yeah. Super briefly, I, I love that you made this point, Julia. I just wanted to point out that you know what you're saying is is 100 true, but there's a potentially bright side here. If we get things right, if we build these things in a in a humane and just way, then there's a potential for all the people who did contribute to that data pool to receive a dividend for it. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is a trivial problem to solve. Um, there's a lot of kind of operational logistical questions here, but there are. Um, some amazing people out there like Jaron Lanier comes to mind. He's one of the most brilliant thinkers that I'm aware of. He's, he's written a couple of books on this topic. Data is labor, data as labor, and, and how to kind of fairly compensate people for their contributions. Um, yeah. But you could provide a form of UBI actually to people on this basis if you if we could figure out how to do this. Right. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And um, it's also bringing up the question of um, uh, diversity of thought in the cultural output, because right now um, the internet has a bias, like the simplest experiment you can do is if you just Google family, like most of the families will be white and Western and affluent that will come up in stock pictures. Or if you Google just a picture of a hand, it's very likely to be a white hand. And um, if we look at the um, the user base of Wikipedia and Reddit and other places that have contributed a lot to the training of these models, um, they are predominantly male and Western. Um, and so we also want to make sure that with all the, the training that's provided that there is um, some way of, of balancing what, what the input and the output is actually going to be. And that is a tough question to answer because uh, a lot of the people um, who are creating the content have done so because they are in a position where they have the free time to put on the internet or they even have the access to internet to, to do so. Um, so how do we provide a, a balanced perspective that, that represents all the interests of humanity? And I think in a way, a solution to this does not come from just engineering. Um, right now, you know, a lot of engineers think about AI alignment and um, how to get AI right. And so naturally they will think about engineering approaches of how do we test transparency and robustness. And that is all very important. But these particular issues that, that we've just been talking about are um, issues that the humanities have thought about to bring back through history. There's um, lots of instances where uh, minorities have struggled for progress and achieved it. There's been a civil rights movement and a human rights movement. See, we have Anne-Marie Brooks in, in here, who um, is a leader of an um, institution and NGO on human rights. And um, I think these problems will need to be solved by bringing in people from the humanities, from human rights and civil rights and, and progress movements to understand how this has actually happened. And in a way, this may sound this this may sound like the most alarmist <laughs> that I'm going to get on this panel um, is that it may be our last chance to get things right because once AI systems are in place and firmly established, they may be going in those routes for the next hundreds of years, and it will be very difficult to reverse course on things that have been put in place. So. Um, Something I care about this year is to um, contribute what I can to make sure that we get things right from the start, because this is all very path dependent, um, and to to make sure that um, that this transition from the pre AI world to the post AI world goes well. So, um, sorry, I wanted to. Yeah, I wanted to share a couple of things. First of all, I was excited uh, to see that uh, Emory Brook is joining us, someone who's really a great world expert on measuring the um, impact on human rights um, of, of a whole variety of things. And so I think 
someone could seriously be better positioned uh, than Emory and her organization to try to systematically and quantitatively look at the human rights impact uh, of these kinds of technologies. And so that seems um, very exciting. And, and Emory, if you, if you come to have anything you'd like to share about what you see as the major issues here, I, I would very much love to hear your, your thoughts. Um, but I don't want to want to put you on the spot. I'll let you jump in if you would, would like. Um, I, I want to go uh, from a biologist standpoint uh, and look at this question that we've raised about the historical perspective. And you know, as a biologist, I look at this largely as an evolutionary question. And uh, the nature of uh, evolution is typically that the participants are not very well in control of the process as it unfolds. There is on some level a, a bit of a destiny that, that takes place. And, and I see that as, as very likely or at least possibly what's gonna happen here. And, and so I see two essential dimensions that I think about as I look at how this is going to play out. One is whether a greater and greater intelligence, potentially uh, greater than our own, will come to be cooperative with us or competitive? And I think there's very likely simply a, an answer to that question that we don't yet know. Um, and it's going to come out to be one or the other. And there's a, a greater uh, wisdom and intelligence than ours. Does it find and continue to find that it, um, in the beneficent sense, wants to be cooperative and one hopes that that is the outcome that it realizes that it you know we we the, the long arm uh, of justice is uh, in fact upheld and and that it wants to be cooperative with us and that that's just what happens whatever we do along the way and whatever it takes to get there. Alternatively, does it turn out that the answer is simply that it's competitive and that like in many other evolutionary processes, um, when a species gains dominance. Uh, you know, as we do with, uh, you know, poultry and um, the, the uh, cockroaches around our own home, uh, it has very little interest in our needs um, and, and it is competitive. And, and the other dimension that I think is very interesting to think about is whether it will come to be an interactive scenario or an independent scenario. And what I mean by that is that it could be that, um, AIs develop and realize that they're essentially independent of us, and they continue to, uh, to, to, to outgrow us and go and do whatever it is they're going to do. Uh, you know, people uh, think about the Drake equation and whether this is going to lead to the colonization of the universe and, and many things we can't yet foresee, but that essentially it just does it and, and we get to watch from the sidelines, uh, or whether it's a more interactive um, scenario. And on the interactive, and so you can see this as sort of a two by two scenario. And, and the interactive in the positive sense, we can imagine that the AIs um, do incredible things for and with us, that we do these things together and that we transform uh, the world in ways that we can scarcely begin to imagine. We can also imagine that it turns out just evolutionarily that when a greater power comes to play, it becomes competitive and that the AIs decide that they do interact with us in a negative sense um, and that software does quite literally eat the world and that we like it or not are coming towards a scenario where um, the AIs see us as a threat or want our resources and given that they are going to have greater intelligence than us, um, if, if that's the, the fundamental quadrant that we are heading towards, it's difficult for me to see how any um, approach could stop that. So, so OpenAI has recently been talking about how, you know, we could create uh, non-super intelligent AIs to try to regulate the more intelligent or more super intelligent AIs. It's difficult for me to really conceptualize, and those are, you know, a lot of smart people, but how you have a less intelligent technology trying to control and regulate a more intelligent. And so I think it's unclear to me which of these uh, four quadrants we end up in, but I think there's a very real possibility and it's something that I think about that like evolution that's been going on for, for millions of years, this is simply going to play out. And that's not to say we can't and should not absolutely be trying to influence it, but that there's largely a, 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 some, some 
in the longer term, foreordained outcomes here that are just going to happen that are based on the logic of the, the, the reality of what happens when greater intelligence is developed. It's powerful um, and poignant statements that you're making there, Christopher. I'm mindful of time. We've got five minutes to go and I'd love to pass it back over to our panelists for any final thoughts um, from today's discussion or just wider you know, ethics, security and privacy around AI and what we could potentially do as a positive action or um, you know, moment to end on. But we'll discuss you know, ethics, privacy, security, regulation, equity, inclusion, education, education, education. Lane, you mentioned that a few times as well. Um, but yeah, I do feel like things are changing um, on the monthly, weekly, daily, hourly basis with this technology and would love to hear any final comments or thoughts around the potential positive opportunities and what we should be focusing our energy and efforts on. Yeah, I, I can um, close my thoughts with saying that New Zealand can indeed take a leadership role on ethical AI here for many reasons. One for its um, unique ge geographical location, for its um, its role historically of being in the forefront of progress and democracy, and also for being small and nimble enough to actually act fast um, where the, the communication lines and government may be shorter than in other places. Um, and also New Zealand being um, already an example for innovative organizations and human rights such as exemplified by, by Anne Marie's organization. Um, so since this was a um, New Zealand organized uh, panel, is, uh, I wanna stress that, that I am actually hopeful for the role of New Zealand in global ethical AI. It's really wonderful thought, Julia. Thank you for, for sharing. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think I'll go in a slightly different direction with my closing thought, which is uh, you know, showing my bias here as a software developer and as a builder and as an entrepreneur. Um, <clears throat> I really encourage everyone here, everyone listening to this, to roll up your sleeves and try playing with these tools if you haven't already. I know, I know Christopher said this earlier as well. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure I would have said that a year ago. Uh, in fact, I definitely would not have said it a year ago. I'm not sure I would have said it three or four months ago, but they, they've really reached a place quite recently, a kind of a, I don't know what to call it, an inflection point, um, where, as Christopher said, they're, you know, having a, a positive impact on my life day to day as well. And they are, in certain moments, I won't say everywhere and everything, but making me feel like I have superpowers. Um, and I would like for everyone to have that experience. Um, you know, they're they're pretty accessible, I think. I, I threw OpenAI under the bus earlier, but I'll uh, thank them for making uh, the 3.5 version of ChatGPT free and available to the public. And so that's out there. You can play with it. Google Bard um, it is also available. And I think at Microsoft uh, you know, ha has their version of this. Um, the uh, image stuff as well. So Stable Diffusion is open source. Kudos to them. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's there's free versions of, uh, uh, of a number of the kind of um, generative art tools as well. Um, yeah, again, just to reiterate, you, you really can't appreciate these tools, both their strengths and their weaknesses and, and the, uh, the risks and the potential, both of which we spoke about uh, in great length today, um, unless you play with them. And uh, I, I found, um, you know, a few conversations with folks who had not had the opportunity to do that. Uh, they changed their tune once they had had a chance to play with them. Um, and there's, you know, good resources out there and there's learning groups. I, I'm a part of a couple of these. So I didn't, you know, encourage folks to, to reach out if, if they, uh, you know, are feeling stuck or, or need some pointers or resources. Yeah, so uh, thanks very much. And thanks again for creating this conversation. I'd like to really follow on that by uh, suggesting that anyone who hasn't try to figure out what these tools can do for you personally. They're just simply life-changing. And um, they have been for everyone that I know who has uh, given them a meaningful try. And I'll give you a couple of examples of how you can get started and some things that I think haven't gotten as much press coverage, um, but that I think people can try in their day-to-day -day life. And to the issue about access and um, uh, the digital divide, I think these are quite available to almost anyone who can even just walk to a library and, and, and sit down at a 
in a terminal for a few minutes. Um, one of the more breathtaking things that I've discovered is that a conversation with a generative AI is in many ways a conversation with the collective wisdom of our entire species. And that's just unthinkable in prior times. And so I've just asked this thing again and again and again to be my mentor. And it's an incredible mentor. And so people have used it in very narrow ways. You know, can you solve this very problem, very narrow problem for me? And, you know, a lot of the articles in the newspaper are like, well, it, it didn't succeed with whatever that thing was. Well, my view is at this point, my default is if it hasn't done what you asked it, it's on you. That you haven't figured out how to ask it to correctly yet. Um, but on the mentorship point, I, I really encourage everyone to try asking AI to literally be your mentor and take a challenging mentorship question that you would like to go to the greatest mentor you can imagine in your field, name that person and ask the AI what that person would counsel you on in uh, on the particular question that you have. And I've done that a number of times on a whole bunch of different questions with a whole bunch of different inspirational figures and gotten incredibly practical advice that frankly, I think was often better. And, and I think I, I've been fortunate enough that I've had some truly world-class mentors that the AI was often able, I think, to uh, succeed in even beyond what the, the world's greatest human mentors are capable of. And that is now available to everyone. Um, and so I'll, I'll just end there. I think it's, it's incredible what it has to offer for all of us if we choose to use it. I, I would like to temper that um, because while I agree, it's, it's very interesting to get all these text generations we do need to remind ourselves that we are dealing with language models, which are a, you know, a, a very fancy autocomplete. Um, and if we talk with the models in a certain way where we wanted to give a certain answer, we can typically get that answer. And we can typically get, um, you know, tell us to do A if we want to go in that direction or to B if we want to go into that direction. And it um, right now, we would not assume that it has the same sort of sentience and internal compass as a human teacher or, or a human might do who might actually sometimes surprise us with the answer and, and disagree with us and such because it is just um, trying to emulate what it's like to talk to these, which is still which can still be very useful, but we do want to remind ourselves that that's what it is. Thank so you. as as you brought that up, I'm just gonna say, my reactions over and over again have been in the opposite direction. They've been over and over again that when I've asked it to do things, the way that it has surprised me when asked correctly was that it has dramatically exceeded my expectations relative to what I think literally any living human could do. Mm. And, and that's been the experience that I've had. Maybe you're incredibly good at prompts, Christopher. <laughs> anyway. Um, it actually reminds me, I was speaking at a panel discussion at the University of Auckland Engineering School alongside a chat GPT powered AI bot. And one of the questions, and it's the first time I've spoken alongside a bot, um, one of the questions that came from the audience is, what are the skills that you need to thrive in the future of work with these rapidly changing technologies? And um, I believe it probably fell on deaf ears because there's a whole bunch of engineers in the room, but I feel the skills that we need are those that be deeply human skills. So learning how to love, grieve, empathize, um, and really, yeah, I don't, at this moment in time, I don't believe the bots can teach you how to do that. But anyway, thank you so much. Thank you so much to our panelists and for your insightful perspectives and comments, our attendees for your wonderful questions, and Erica as well for being our wonderful tech host. I'm going to pass it back over to you uh, to close us with a karakia. Apologies. Kia ora, Jade. Yeah, yeah I thank you, Jade, heard. as well. Oh, thank you, Jade. Yes. Thank um, you, Jade. And yeah, thank you to our panelists, Julia, Lane, and Christopher for taking the time today. Um, definitely have a few um, points in my notebook for me to ponder and action on in the space of generative AI. Um, and so just um, a reminder that you will find the recording on the EHF um, website shortly, and there will be other EHF live sessions with our amazing fellows coming up. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, I will close with a karakia. Tuya i runga, tuya i raro, tuya i roto, tuya i waho, tuya i te here tangata, ka rongo te po, ka rongo te ao. Ti hei Māori ora, ngā mahi nui, tā ki te anu.
Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora.